Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is Lieutenant General Morrison. He's the Deputy Chief of Staff G6 for the United States Army. Uh, we're very excited to have him here today to talk about the uh, future of the Signal Corps and maybe hear a little bit about his experiences coming up as a signal officer. Uh, General, thank you for joining us today, sir. Thank you very much. It's an uh, honor to be here. So uh, first question I wanted to ask, sir, and kind of just to jump right into the interview, I noticed you're wearing an advanced rate as parachutist badge. Uh, you have some uh, airborne experiences in your background. And we are since we're a chapter of the 82nd Airborne Association, my listeners would be really kind of excited to hear. What were your experiences as an airborne signal leader coming up? Where did you serve when we were on status? Things of that nature. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. It was actually my second assignment. Uh, my first one was uh, as a platoon leader and company commander over in Europe. But I'd always heard about how uh, if you really wanted to do mission, you went to Fort Bragg. And so I was blessed to get an assignment after the captain's career course uh, and go to Bragg and got to be there for about four and a half years. So that was my first airborne assignment. And then I went off and I don't want to sound like a heretic to a bunch of paratroopers out there, but then I did a couple stints in the 1st Cavalry Division. And then the Army, in its infinite wisdom, put me in charge of an airborne brigade down at uh, the Joint Communication Support Element in Tampa. But uh, I, I will tell you, you know, I, I thought about this question as you, you laid it out. And what I remember most about my time at Bragg was the need to integrate with those that we support and be a part of the team and be at the table and bring value at it. Uh, you, we all know that, you know, when you serve in the airborne community, it's all about outcomes. And if you're not bringing outcomes, uh, then you're probably not going to get that seat at the table and be a part of the team. And so that's what I remember. And I actually consider my time at Fort Bragg absolutely foundational in just about everything that I did afterwards. And quite frankly, uh, when I was in the 1st Cavalry Division, brought a lot of those lessons into the division as from the heavy perspective, they looked at how they would support contingency operations. Just a fantastic learning experience. No, thank you for that really detailed answer, sir. And, and you kind of segued into a uh, the second question. So, being focused on outcomes, being focused on being able to provide the the communicate portion of shoot, move, and communicate. As you've had those developmental experiences, moved through the level of command, got to work a special assignments like the Joint Communication Support Element. What changes have you seen in how the Signal Corps supports? I mean, the ethos should remain the same, always accomplish the mission, enable command and control. But have, have there been any fundamental changes in how support is provided or how Signal Force is organized to support the warfighter? So that's a great question. You know, so I was going to start it off with the number one thing that I've seen change is the technology. You know, I'm, I'm going to date myself, but when I came in, it was crypto cards that you would set manually and shove them back into, you know, a KIV, and you were off to, it wasn't even called a KIV back in the day. Uh, but now, you know, my, the first switchboard I was ever around was literally a patch panel switchboard, and now look at what we put into our tactical formations. And, and that's all a testament to the men and women uh, of the Sigma Corps, to be able to adapt in I would submit to you it's a relatively short amount of time and quite frankly come up with innovative solutions on their own. And so that's how I've really seen it change over the course of time. What I haven't seen change is that, you know, the, I, I always tell people that signal leaders are probably the most adaptive soldiers in our army. Their ability to just figure it out, you know, under a lot of pressure, forget the stressors of just combat. Now you've got the stressors of a maneuver commander who just wants their stuff working right now. And then you wrap that all into the advent of cyberspace operations. That ethos has remained steady. The adaptability of our signal core has remained very, very steady. And I'm, I'm just so proud to be associated with such a tremendous group that really gets after making the mission happen and quite frankly, satisfying a commander's requirements before they even know it's a requirement. Roger that, sir. Uh, you, you 
cyber operations are becoming increasingly important in the the operational battle space, and they're you know sort of part of the signal portfolio. Obviously, with a transition from away from overseas contingency operations being focused on a, a counterinsurgency fight for the past almost 20 years now, and we're focusing more on near peer competitors. Are reading today's headlines? You certainly see that cyberspace operations are being you know, definitely incorporated more. We have a new cyber core, uh, things of that nature. But is the signal core fundamentally changing how it's organizing for combat in order to deal with near compare near peer competitor threats and more cyber operations? And of course, I understand if we get into anything sensitive, there may be things you can't answer. But if you could give a, a broad unclass answer to that question, that would be terrific. Yeah, so, so, so I think I can. The um, but but I'm, I'm going to expand your question a little bit. You know, so right now the signal core is in the midst of. Uh, its greatest reform since I've been in. You know, our expeditionary signal battalions are now transitioning to expeditionary signal battalion enhanced. So think of legacy JNN and CPNs and the ability that to support like 30 command posts, but now put a smaller, lighter, much more agile, much more scalable kit that allows you to support 48 command posts. And oh, by the way, with a lot less people on the order of magnitude of around 80 to 90, we're, we're still messing with some of the numbers. So increased capacity, less people. The big idea is how do you transform for what you were talking about? And how do you transform the regiment to support multi-domain operations? Well, when you take a look at cyberspace operations, there's three components. Everybody knows the offensive side. Then there's the defensive side that is done by the Cyber Protection Brigade and some of our reserve component partners. But the foundation of cyberspace operations is DOD NOPS, you know, Department of Defense Information Network Operations. That is what the Signal Regiment does. And so if you're going to move towards this future against, and you're going to fight multi-domain multi operations against a near peer, the signal regiment must realign itself. I would submit transform itself to be able to do do not from a global scale all the way down to the tactical edge. Because the folks talking about these near peers will have the ability to attack our networks at the edge. It will be an integral part of what we're doing. And the group of folks that is responsible for operating, maintaining, securing, and defending the Army's contribution to the Doden, whether it's tactical or enterprise, is a signal regiment. And so all those personnel um, efficiencies, I'm not even going to call them savings, that are coming out of the ESB enhanced, we are aligning against that global DODENOP framework so that we can support uh, our Army and the Joint Force in a multi-domain fight. And it, it is significant uh, what is being shifted over to get after that ability on echelon to operate, maintain, secure, and defend the Doden. I mean, it, it is on the order of magnitude of 700 plus bodies that are going just to support that framework. It's a significant yep. investment by our Army. Roger that, sir. So when we're talking about investments in capabilities and being able to it's not that what you just described obviously sounds like greatly enhanced capabilities more efficient use of personnel uh I'll, not a different way of doing business but a, a a more effective way of doing business do you see that the framework of modularity with uh the bct as the centerpiece of the tactical framework do you see that that is still going to be something that we see in the future against near peers supported by these expeditionary signal battalions enhanced or do you think there will be a wholesale reorganization of our war fighting structure to to better be able to use these new capabilities in offensive and defensive operations is the is the division going to become the centerpiece again of how we fight or are we going to stay more modular it's a, it's a great question you know and i'll give you a, a typical pentagon answer yes <laughs> You know, the, uh, and, and I, I'm teasing, obviously, but uh, so right now, most of our modernization efforts 
on the tactical side are focused on BCT and below. There, it, it, for all the right reasons, because that's where we had the most work to do and making sure that we had a tactical network that we then could scale vertically. And that when I say vertically, it means to the division and to the core level. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, discussions that we've had with Army Futures Command, that's got to scale all the way back into the enterprise so that we have a unified network, not what we have today where they're two separate and distinct efforts that we try to bring together in the center. That's usually not a good way to be building networks. Got to build it from the edge and bring it all the way back in so that we can leverage investments like what we're doing with the cloud, et cetera. Now that's going to be the power of what we're doing, a unified network. And so um, I, I think you're going to see more, I don't think, you're going to start seeing more and more emphasis on division maneuver and core maneuver to get after your specific question. Now, we, as a part of this Doden transformation, the signal regiment uh, transformation that we were talking about, we are transitioning our uh, theater tactical signal brigades to core signal brigades with the ability to command and control three to five expeditionary signal battalions enhanced. That doesn't mean we're doing anything with the G6. We're just aligning that DOTNOP framework so that we do have a maneuver element at the core level that supports the orders that come through the six through the three. Again, it's all about lining and getting roles and responsibilities on echelon straight. I'm not quite sure what it's going to look like at the division level yet. Uh, as a part of the rebalance, we're reinforcing and putting uh, uh, cyber, defensive cyber, um, DOTEN and CE maintenance uh, capabilities back into the Division G6. Probably went too low uh, in our numbers of, uh, at the division level as we went to modularity, so we're reinforcing that. But we're also putting some of those organic systems back into the BCT formations. So that we, again, so we have an echelon the right way. Time will tell what the maneuverability of the network from a division standpoint will be. But what I will tell you is we'll be very, very smart about it. We'll do it through experimentation as we work that vertical integration. And then, and then the Army will make the, the, the appropriate puts and takes and do smart things. I hope that answered your question. I know that was a little lengthy. No, it really did, sir. That was actually more, kind of even more than I hoped for because we, re we really brushed on core operations as well. So with kind of re returning those theater signal brigades to almost a core signal brigade status with that ability to command and control three to five subordinate battalions. Is that still going to be sort of a modular structure? A different expeditionary signal battalion could be aligned under it? Or are those is that going to be a permanent standing relationship where that brigade will have command and control over three to five standing battalions at any given time? Yeah, so it's the ability. It's, so it's, I wouldn't think of it in terms of standing command and control. It's the ability to do it. Track and super. And, and the ability to do it uh, as the core maneuvers. That, that's really the key. You know, the, the other part that I didn't mention is our current theater strategic signal brigades, and they're all our OCONUS brigades. They're already hybrid formations, but what we didn't put in them was two things. The ability to really do dough knops at their echelon, and then two, even though they have expeditionary signal battalions assigned to them, they have no tactical uh, C2 capabilities. So they're also transitioning as a part of this uh, transformation. They're going from being theater strategic signal brigades to just theater signal brigades. And we're building, we're building in that additional Doden Ops capability, as well as the ability to support up to two expeditionary signal battalion enhanced. And when you hit that tripwire where you need a third, that's when you would flow in one of the core signal brigades. Track and sir. I appreciate the, that uh, expansion of the answer and uh, clarification. Uh, you alluded to working with Army Futures Command uh, in an earlier answer. The Army Futures Command, new four-star command, coming up on a little over two years old. How is the relationship between uh, Headquarters DA and AFC shaping up as they kind of get their feet under them, focus on their cross-functional teams? Are, 
is that kind of new territory where you're feeling it out or is it still the, the standing relationship like you'd have with a TRADOC or a FORCECOM being applied with Army Futures Command as well, since they've got such a large modernization portfolio? Is it a little bit different or is it kind of staff work as usual? It's new, you know, and I'm just going to use the analogy of, you know, so cyber is roughly 10 years old. I've, I've been involved with it since the start um, and we're still adjusting some of the things that we're doing you know we are adjusting team compositions training standards because we're starting to get sets and reps same same with army futures command you know so you're right they're two years old uh, i think the relationship between army futures command and the department of the army is very positive um, matter of fact i was down there on friday uh, meeting with uh, the army futures commander and uh, and the rest of his staff the uh, but but it's going to continue to evolve, you know, and as we get more sets and reps, there will be adjustments as we work through what business processes need to be. Uh, you're already starting to see the pace of change accelerate in a very positive way. And I think that's because you have a four star commander who wakes up every morning and that's what they're driving on is modernizing our army. And so I, I, I see nothing but goodness and where we're at and where we're heading. Roger that, sir. So getting a little bit more uh, futuristic focus since we just talked about Army Futures Command, uh, the areas of artificial intelligence, is that starting to be uh, very seriously considered as we talk about using machine learning, talking about using big data, talking about automating more processes, uh, or are we still very sensitive to things like, you know, observed fires, sensor shooter, human in the loop. How, how is the Army square in that circle as science is progressing and artificial intelligence becomes part of uh, our daily lives on the civilian side? Yeah, you know, so, I mean, yes, it's a serious topic of conversation, right? Um, I mean, it has to be. It's a, it's a rapidly emerging technology and capability. Um, and, and certainly uh, our adversaries are studying it very, very closely. So therefore, it would be prudent uh, for us to be doing the same. What, what I will say is the way we're going to cut our teeth on this is really through experimentation on things like project convergence. Because it, it's a whole host of things that are changing in this world and this explosion of uh, information capabilities that's, that's coming out. And it's, and it, it's not just if, if we approach it as technology just for technology's sake, we're probably going to miss. It needs to be approached from, you know, from a complete .mil PF perspective on how this uh, technology really impact our warfighting abilities. Uh, I will tell you, inside the cyber domain, uh, big data is, I'm not going to sit there and say that, you know, we're at full operational capability, but we're well on a journey to where we're able to scarf off tons of information, make sense of it, so we can understand what's happening inside the cyber domain. The, uh, that will continue to morph over time. The things like establishing, you know, real zero trust principles to where we're able to shove that all the way down to the tactical edge, so we know that the data and the information that is flying over a network is trusted, it's secure, it's verifiable, and it's authoritative which will then enable us to do a whole bunch of other things as machine learning and artificial intelligence continue to evolve. But it's gotta be looked at soup the nuts. Again, we can't look at it just from a technology perspective. How does it fit in the war fighting from a doctrine, an organization, a material, all the way through the dot mil PF portion of this? And I'll tell you, it is very promising. You know, and if we align it right, it's going to allow us to do much like we're doing with the Expeditionary Signal Battalion Enhanced enhanced uh, Formations. It's going to allow us to do a heck of a lot more with a heck of a lot less and a heck of a lot faster. You know, and that is going to be the key to winning in a multi-domain fight. No, Roger that, sir. So as we talk about this multi-domain fight and th these enhanced cyber capabilities, are we seeing more cyber literacy among non-cyber and non-signal soldiers, people understanding the effects of their 
their digital footprint, if you will, like the the, the well-known idea of, you know, Joe's got his iPhone in the field. And so now his squad can be, uh, you know, pinpointed by enemy EW capabilities. Is that cyber literacy getting out to the uh, the combat formations and the non-signal troops? Is that something that we're stressing so we can uh, you know better protect ourselves in forward areas? Yeah, so you cross streams on me a little bit. The, uh, <laughs> so, so I'm going to give you a, a two-part answer. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, maneuver commanders understand it. They're getting it. Um, and they understand what the future operating environment is going to be like. And the key that cyberspace operations, to include the electromagnetic spectrum, are going to play in that fight. So, so that's that's the great news. Commanders are clearly starting to understand it and understand the importance of it. The challenge that I have for all signal and cyber operators is you need to be able to explain what you bring to the fight in maneuverous terms. You know, it, you know, I have a good friend of mine who sat there and said, you know, the first time that a cyber protection team showed up in their formation, uh, they went and they started talking to them. And it was completely in non-operational terms, overly technical. And he goes, John, they ended up going to the land of misfit toys. Again, it goes back to what I learned in the airborne community all those years ago. You've got to be at the table. You've got to bring value added. You've got to help the maneuver commander get to outcomes. And so that, that's that portion of it. Break, break. The, the second piece of it is, is how do we inculcate that training, multi-domain operations, and training to operate in that environment into our tactical formations. We've got work to do there, especially on the electromagnetic spectrum side of things. You know, the on the cyber side, I'm actually a little bit more comfortable because everybody's dealing with cybersecurity. Everybody's trying to make sure their systems are up to date. But that operating in a contested and congested Electronic magnetic spectrum environment is quite frankly something that uh, if, if you weren't around against the old Soviets back in the day, you probably don't have a lot of experience doing it. Roger, and so true. that that is something that we've got to inculcate into our formations, get the right training packages out there so that they can uh, replicate operating in that environment. And quite frankly, just teaching some, you know, some TTPs, and I'm sure everybody on this net is very familiar with. Like, you don't key the handset for a minute and a half. That's probably <laughs> bad. You know, going back to the old days of, you know, very, very brief communications to get your message across. And so, some of this is a little bit of relearning old lessons. Some of it is not because technology and the capabilities of our adversaries have certainly changed. But we do have some work to do in that area. I, I hope that answered your question, sir. No, it, it certainly did, General. And thank you very much again for your uh, your complete answers and your and your candor. And that kind of brought us back full circle because it is all about supporting the, the the maneuver forces and getting the right outcomes in order to be able to fight and win on the modern battlefield. And I'm right up against the amount of time I promised your staff I'd take away from your schedule, sir. So I just want to thank you very much for coming out and talking to us today. Uh, again, this has been Lieutenant General Morrison, the Deputy Chief of Staff G6 for the United States Army. Sir, it's been an honor and a privilege to have this conversation today. Thank you very much. The honor has been all mine. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Stay safe. Roger that, sir. Roger that.